Uh, so everybody should see um, keynote on my desktop. Should be a presentation. So module one. This is this is where we all begin. We're going to start learning how to program in Python. Now, there are two things you need when you pro when you program. You need to understand the language itself, the syntax, the commands, the keywords. But for new programmers especially, you have to understand how to talk to a computer. And I'm going to say this several times during the class, especially in week three. Computers are stupid. Okay? Computers, we think of computers as the amazing smart machines. The truth of the matter is a computer can only think in binary, which means on or off. It's like a light switch. You turn the light on, you turn the light off. It's not even a dimmer switch. It's just a light switch. So we have to change our thinking in order to get the computer to understand what we want. And that is part of learning how to program. You have to be able to think how the computer needs you to think. Um, so let's get started. So pro all programs have the same flow. At least all programming languages I have ever used have the same flow. Input, process, and output. Input is some kind of external input into the script. User input. An example would be when I'm testing my students' games and I put in a direction, I'm going to type that direction on the keyboard and hit the Enter key. That has to get into my program somehow, and that's input. We're going to learn how to do that tonight. Process, what happens inside my algorithm. An algorithm is a series of statements that do something. They can do lots of things, but they do something. They take the input, they modify the input, and they give you output. And output is just the result of whatever that process is with the addition of the input. Could people be mute? So this is just the basic. Let me mute everyone because I'm getting a lot of feedback. Um, hold on. Okay. Not getting feedback anymore. That's good. Um, okay. So what we see here on the screen is a bunch of junk. What we see here on the screen is a flowchart. That's what's on the right-hand side of the screen. And this is, represents what happens in a program. And there are some, uh, I, I start with flowcharts in week one and week two. In week three, we go to pseudocode. Uh, these are ways of representing the logic without having to know the language itself. They are tools you can use. Right here on the right hand side of the screen is a flowchart. Flowchart always has a start and it always has an end. We have input and output and processes in the middle and the shapes are specific so when you do your flowcharts make sure, especially if you're in my class, make sure your shapes are right. There's that um, rectangle that's off kilter. There is the process in the middle, which is a rounded square, and there's a start and the end. And we're also going to learn a few more things as time goes on. But when you're thinking about writing code, this is where you want to start. What are my inputs? What am I supposed to do with it? And what is someone expecting to get, get back when I'm done? Okay, we're going to start with some building blocks. The very first building block of any program is a variable. A variable is a space in memory. So computers have two resources. They have space and they have speed. And speed is basically processor and how fast they work, and that's why we can play all the big multi, multi, what is it, multiplayer games out online that we can do and all the wonderful things because computers are very fast. They're very fast binary machines. And then there's space. We all know space is like RAM. How much RAM do you have? How much disk space? In a running program, you're talking about RAM. So that's random access memory. 
And that's where the storage occurs. So every time you have a piece of data, say I've typed north into my keyboard, that those, key, those letters, N-O-R-T-H, are going to take up space. They're going to take up space in the program. And I have to know how to store that and where to put it. So I create a variable, and I store it in a memory space, and I tell Python, okay, this is the name of that memory space, and that memory space contains a value. So every variable has a name. It, it stores data, so it has space, and it exists in a specific scope. For right now, all we're going to talk about is the global scope. In week three, we'll begin to talk about different scopes, like the local scope. I just slow. Could everybody please mute? Um, for right now, I just want to introduce the concept and the word scope. As time goes on, we will become more familiar with what scope is, and that really starts in week three. Now, here's one of the things I like to do in class. I like to break out of the PowerPoint presentation, and I like to open up PyCharm. PyCharm is the, an IDE, it's the Integrated Development Environment that we use in this class. And even though you guys don't have to do anything until next week, I like to get it started now because it's, it's, there's a lot to learn, and this is one of those things to learn. This is PyCharm. PyCharm has a lot of great features. One of the features that I like most is something called the debugger. The debugger allows me to see inside my program and see what's happening at any given time. So when I use PyCharm, I have my Python script. And by the way, just to let everybody know, a lot of students originally have a problem figuring out where their script lives. So when they have to submit the PY file, they're not quite sure how to do that. The best way, if, unless you can look over here and look at where it is, you can also right click, hold on, did it wrong. You can also right click and for those in Windows it will say show in folder. For Mac users like me it will be reveal in finder and it will take you to in your file system the place where that Python script lives. And that way you can always know how to get your Python script when you're supposed to be submitting it starting in a couple of weeks, actually starting yeah, week two. So this is just a Python script. It's got a couple of variables, got a couple of statements. Line three is a variable. How do I know line three is a variable when I'm sitting here looking at it? Well, I know it's a variable because, first of all, I have the name of something. It's not illegal. It doesn't have spaces and things. And there's a single equal sign. And I make a distinction between single equal sign and double equal sign because there is a difference. And in week three, that difference becomes obvious. For week one and week two, we deal with a single equal sign. And it is called the assignment operator. So, and on the right-hand side of the assignment operator, I have a value, in this case, 10. So I know my var is a variable because it is on the left-hand side of a single equal sign. And I know that the value of my var is 10 because it is on the right-hand side of that single equal sign. So that is how you read this line of code. That's one of the things that I'm not thrilled when it comes to Zybooks. Zybooks has some really great, great qualities, but it doesn't teach you how to read code. You have to know how to read it, and you have to know how to write it. And this is how you read code. So my var is a variable. So on the left-hand side of a single equal sign, 10 is the value. So let's go back to here. We'll go to the next slide. Okay, so how do we define a variable? We define a variable by having the name of a variable. A variable can't, name can't have spaces. It can't have special characters except an underscore. After the variable, I have the assignment operator. And after the assignment operator, I have a value. That's a variable. And I'm going to say this a lot for the first three weeks of class. 
I'm going to say I know it's a variable because it's on the left-hand side of a single equal sign. And that's just to remind everybody, especially the newbies. So, hi, John Scripps. Can I please have everyone um, mute? Okay, thank you for muting. So I have a variable. So let's look at what the storage, let's just get a picture of the storage. So I have a variable called amount. The value is 10. What does Python see? Python says I have a name and I have a value. So the name is amount and the value is 10. And this is how Python handles it, okay? You have the name of a memory at, of, of a space in memory, and then you have the value with, which is actually in memory. So if you're thinking about variables, almost think about it like a table. One, one uh, column is the name, and the other column is the value. And if you want to know what the value is, or want to know what the value for that name is, you just look in the table. Python does the same thing. OK, using a variable. So total coins, okay, and then we'll go look at this in the challenge. Um, I have a bunch of variables here. And I also have some stuff that we haven't done yet. I've got this int thing. I've got this input. We are going to get to those tonight. Unfortunately, in some of these challenges, you have to put the cart before the horse. Oh, and by the way, for everyone out there, the challenges are not graded. They are not required. You do not have to do the challenges to get a grade for them in this class. I encourage everyone to do as many challenges as it helps you to get familiar with the material, but they are not required. So I have some variables here. I have total coins. I have nickel count. I have dime count. I have total coins again. Now, total coins on the first line and total coins on the fourth line are both the same variable. Because I can reuse a variable name and just put another amount in the variable name. So I have three variables, total coins, nickel count, and dime count. I'm going to initially set total coins to zero. That's going to be its value. Nickel count is going to be something that I enter. That's what that input statement is. Dime count is going to be something that I enter. That's what that input state is, statement is. And then I'm going to do something with it. I'm going to add nickel count to dime count, and I'm going to print total coins. So I have input, process, and output here. My two input statements, my process statements, where I have nickel count plus dime count, and I print. So I'm just going to remind you where the assignment operators are because I got a little ahead of myself. So nickel count is the same. So whatever I input for nickel count, dime count, and then I'm going to print total coins. So down here, the way these uh, I try and lay out the slides is down in the left-hand corner and down in the right-hand corner, you will see any associated script in the left-hand corner. And the Zybook reference section in the lower right hand corner and that's so if you're looking at this and you want to go back and see what Zybook says about it it's easy to get there so we're going to go to challenge 1.11.2 and we will actually run through that 1.11.2 this is a chat this is just challenge it's write a statement that assigns total coins with the sum of nickel and dime count Simple output for 100 nickels and 200 times is 300. So we're going to do, we're going to walk through this in the debugger. Um, as I said before, the debugger makes me happy. It is one of my favorite, um, one of my favorite things about integrated development environments. First thing I have to do is I'm going to have to edit the configuration to tell PyCharm what I'm running. And I'm going to go here. I'm going to go here. So now it's up here. PyCharm knows what I'm running. So there are two symbols up here. There's the run symbol and there's the debug symbol. We're going to use the debug symbol a lot. So when I hit the debug, 
you'll see the screen change. Now there's a couple things to note. First of all, there's a red dot here. I put that red dot there because I wanted to tell the program to stop. Don't go any farther until I tell you to. Otherwise, Python would just run the whole thing through. Um, and we will see down here that the bottom part of our screen changed. And we have some tabs. We have the Python script that I'm running. We have the console output, which is kind of a fake terminal, kind of a fake screen. We have frames and variables, which basically we have the frames of code. I don't really worry about that. We have variables. I use this a lot because it tells me what variables are defined and what their values are. So I am now, you see here, I have no variables defined. None. There's nothing in here. Nothing is defined. And that's because my Python program hasn't done anything yet. The only thing it's done is started and stopped on line 5. So how am I going to get it to define that variable and put that 0 into memory? Well, Python has to execute the line of code. And until I tell it to, it won't. Now, you're not running in the debugger and you just tell it to go. It'll simply run the line of code. But you have to understand that you are going through a series of steps to get to the answer that hopefully you want. So I'm going to hit the continue. Step o sorry. There is step over, which we're going to use a lot in the first two weeks. There's step into, which we will use when we get to function. There is step into my code, which I don't really use. I use these two all the time. So I'm going to step over line 5. So watch line 5. It goes to line 7. Now, two things happened. Up here, PyCharm was nice enough to tell me that I have a variable called total coins, and its value is 0. And I can even double check that down here. I now have a variable called total coins, and its value is 0. If you ever are in PyCharm and you are running the debugger and you want to know what any variable is, because a lot of time logic errors are because we haven't set the right piece of information at the right time, look down here under variables. So I have nickel count equal int input. Now we haven't gotten to what int is and we haven't gotten to what input is. We will get to those definitions. Input basically says, hold on a minute, stop. Somebody's going to type something on a keyboard, and I'm going to be waiting to catch it. And int will take whatever I type and attempt to turn it into an integer. And we're going to go through exactly what an integer is in a little bit. Again, in this section specifically, we're, going, we're putting the cart before the horse a lot of the time. So I'm going to tell it to step over this line of code. You'll notice it didn't go anywhere. There's no big blue line telling me what I'm on, what's happening. What's happening is it's waiting for my input. So I'm going to say my nickel count is 50. I'm going to hit the Enter key, and you'll see the blue line come up. And if I didn't say so before, that blue line is the line that Python is about to execute. So I typed in 50, and right here I have nickel count colon 50, and you will see down here that I now have nickel count, which is an integer, and its value is 50. I typed in something, input was waiting to catch it, and it brought that value inside my running script. So I'm going to step over dime count. I'm going to go in here, and I'm going to say my dimes are 10. Hit the Enter key. I'm back inside the program. I can look at frames and variables. I now have dime count, which is 10. Now I can also, here's another nifty thing about the IDE, I can at any point in time just mouse over a variable and see what it is. Another handy dandy thing. So in this case, I'm now going to set total coins, which is currently equal to 0. I'm going to set it equal to the output or the, um, of nickel count and dime count. So if I step over that, now, 
Another thing to check is my total coins value just changed to 60. So because it's the same name, it's that same place in memory. So I've gone to the address, which is total count, and I've now put the, the value 60 next to total count. And now I'm going to output that result. So print is just outputting, and we're going to go into that more in a few minutes. And so I'm going to put the total is, and then plus, I did, and I have to convert it to a string, and we'll find out about that. Again, we're putting the cart before the horse. And I um, step over that, it executes, and I have the total is 60. So that was that challenge. Hold on. Let me see if anybody has any questions. No questions. Okay. So we just talked a little bit about ints and int and stir. So Python has four variable types. We have string, which is an ordered collection of letters. We have integer, which is a whole number, float, which is basically a number with a decimal point, and Boolean, which we're going to talk a lot about in Module 3. Excuse me, I needed to get a quick drink of water. Um, a string has quotes. That's how you know that it's a string in Python. Um, an integer does not have quotes, and it does not have a period like a float. A float does not have quotes and it has a decimal point. So that's what a string is, that's what an integer is, and that is what a float is. You can do a lot with those three things, a whole lot. Okay, quick foray into functions because we're about to talk about print and input. And so we have to talk about how to read a function. Input and print and int and stir and some of those other things, they're all functions. Python gives us a whole boatload of functions that we don't have to do anything to get. It's just there. Python has already figured out how to display output to your screen. Python has already figured out how to allow you to enter something on your keyboard and get it into the running program. And it gives us all of that for free. Now, functions have a very specific format. You always have a function name followed by an open and closed parenthesis. Sometimes there's stuff in the middle of that parenthesis, but it's, this is the minimum. It's going to be a function name and a minimum of an open and closed parenthesis. So we got some functions we're going to talk about now. We have conversion functions. So I want to change a string to an integer. I cannot add strings together and expect the outcome to be um, like you would, the, like the sum of two integers. And any time you type something into a Python console, it's a string. Python always assumes everything is a string unless you tell it it is not a string. So how do I tell it it is not a string? I tell it that way by explicitly converting it to a different type. That CONV equal, or is assigning, int myster, the int function, int, open parenthesis, something in the middle, close parenthesis, in this case, what's in the middle is myster, a variable, um, that will take it and tell Python to treat it as an integer and not a string. And then I get the value of 42 that I can add to something or subtract to something. The string that looks like 42, I can't add to something and I can't subtract to something. The same thing happens with a float. With a float, I can have a string. Again, it always starts with a string. In this case, the string is, quote, 3.14, end quote. But I don't want to use it as a string. I want to use it as a float. I want to use it in an arithmetic expression. So I convert it. And in this case, I use the float function. The float function has the word float, open left parenthesis. In this case, I'm going to put the stir in, and I'm going to close the right parenthesis. And then I get a float. So I can also go the other way. I can go from an int or a float to a string. And the way I do that is I use a function called stir. 
Stir takes an argument. That argument is either an integer or a float va uh, variable, and it's inside the parentheses. So that's what type conversion is, and they are all functions. Okay. Int, float, and stir are functions. Okay, so now we get down to the input and the output of things. Input, as we just saw, is the way that you take information, at least in this class, and make it available to the running function. Because there's, really there's a pretty hard line here. There's your running Python script and the rest of the world. And we have to know how to take information that I'm typing and get it into that Python script so that the Python script can do something with it. For your game, it's going to be typing a direction or telling it to pick up something. Um, so Python, again, because it gives us a lot of stuff, gives us two functions. There's a function input, which allows me to enter information into my running script. And then there's print, and print allows me to output it to the console. Now, this is kind of rudimentary in a world where we've got cell phones and mice and games and joysticks or whatever, because sorry, I'm not a gamer. <laughs> um, but this is how you start, okay? We, we have to understand input and output. So we're going to start in a, in a way where you're typing it on the keyboard. Input and print are functions, and input can take no arguments, or it can take a single argument that is a string. Most of what you will do in Zybooks is no argument, because Zybooks can't handle the fact that you're putting an argument in between the parentheses of the input statement. Your game and a lot of the assignments you're going to turn in are going to require that you have text inside the input. Now, the please enter a value is not the value. It is, a, it is a display to the user. And what the user types in as the value. And we'll look at that in just a second. And then print prints whatever, takes whatever is between those parentheses and um, displays it on the screen. And there are two ways to end the print statement. Most print statements, if you don't do anything special, they have a new line, which means it's like you've hit the return key when you're, when you're typing in Microsoft Word, and you go to the next line. There is a way to do it where you don't get the new line, and I bring this up because this is something you're going to need um, several times in this class, and that is to tell Python how to make it end. So I have output ends in a space, comma, and equal quote space quote. So I can have multiple arguments in the print function, and they can be separated with a comma. OK, so let's look at simple input and simple print. Oops, OK, no questions. So let's start with simple input. input. Okay, just a couple of lines of code just to show you kind of again what's happening. So I'm going to, because I like the debugger, I just put a breakpoint. That's what that uh, red ball is, red circle. All I do is near the line number, I click, and I have a breakpoint. So I'm going to debug this. Now, I am on line four. This nice blue line tells me exactly where I am in my program. I haven't done anything. The computer has not done anything. Python has not executed a single line of code yet. When I tell it to step over line four, it will execute that line of code. And down here I can look at my variable and I can see that there's nothing there. So Python hasn't done anything. I can look at my console output, and my console output is blank. Now, when I step over line four, all of a sudden there's the words input something. Input something is this right here. Okay, That's where those words come from. 
Now it wants me to input something. So I'm going to input something, and I'm going to say, hello, class. So I'm going to hit the Enter key, and now you'll see that Python just moved to line 7. So line 4 has completed, and line 4 needed to complete with user input. So if I look here, under my variables, I see I have a variable called myvar defined as hello class. If I look up here in the IDE, it says myvar, and oh, I didn't spell that right, did I? It says hello class. So that was my input. My input was not input something. My input was hello class. So I'm going to now output something, and I'm going to output the, ver the value in the variable myvar. So the value in the variable myvar is hello class. I go back to the console because that's where it's going to put it out. I'm going to step over and it says hello class. So that is very simple input and very simple output. But it describes and displays the way in which you have to interact with the computer. The reason I kind of stay on this subject for a few minutes is because in today's world with computers, we don't understand what a console is. Unless you're on Linux, unless you're actively programming in a console on like a Linux box, you don't know what the console is. Years ago, back in the dark ages when I started, everybody knew what the console is. Everything was done on the console. So it is a paradigm shift when you think of your game. It's a paradigm shift when you think of computers to think of the fact that you're typing something in into this little area down here Something is going to happen in your program, and you're going to get something out. But that's what is going to happen in this class. So you have to get used to the console. OK, I'm talking a lot. So how to call the input function. I just did a little bit, but let's go watch my nice little, um, my nice little graphic. So it's going to read two numbers from user input and then print the sum of those numbers. So how to call the input function. So first of all, down here in the left corner, you've got Professor Lisa. And we're going to do this by the flow chart. Start. We're going to input. So I'm going to have num1. Num1 is a variable. I know it's a variable because it's on the left-hand side of a single equal sign. On the right-hand side of a single equal sign, is the int function, and inside the int function is the input function, because you can do that in Python. You can stack up your function. So this tells me that I'm going to wait for user input, because I have the input function, and I expect the user to be putting in an integer. So that's what I'm expecting. So variable name two functions, open parentheses for the two functions, close parentheses for the two functions, and this is an input statement. Okay, so Professor Lisa is going to type in a number, and it's going to be two. This is my input. So I am specifically showing you the, the Python with the flowchart. Okay, I have num2. I'm going to input something for num2. Num2 is going to be 4. It's still input. So now I'm going on to process. Process is the sum. So I'm going to add num1 plus num2, and I'm also going to output it on the same line. I could have done this a little differently, but I didn't. So the the process of adding num1 and num2 is, in fact, process. And calling the print function is the output. And what's going to happen is that the number 6 is going to be shown on my computer terminal, and I'm going to be done. And this is challenge 3.14. Probably not going to go through all the challenges tonight, but when we're done, if you want me to go through some, we can. Okay, a few rules. You can call one function inside of another. For every open parentheses, you must have a closed parenthesis in the function. They are called balanced. 
and all of your parentheses have to be balanced. You have to have one open. For, for every open parenthesis, you have to have a closed one. And I'll show you what happens if you don't. Print can use a string, integer, float, or Boolean variable. However, if a string, however, if a string is a string, then all integers, floats, and booleans must be converted to a string. However, if the variable is a string, <laughs> sorry, I'll correct that, then everything else has to be converted to a string. So the only time you don't have to convert to a stir is when it's already a string. Other than that, you're pretty much going to want to convert it to a stir. A stir. Okay, so how to call the print function. You can have a single argument or multiple arguments in the print function. And by the way, you don't have to do anything special. Python gives us the print function. And in this place, I have a print function, and I've got 3, 2, 1, go. I've got open and close parentheses. I've got the argument in the middle, and what it's going to print out on the screen is 3, 2, 1, go. I can also call that with two arguments. I can call function name is still print got an open and close parenthesis. In the top one, I have an argument, a comma, and a second argument. And in the bottom one, I have continued. I have just a single argument. So I have line one. Oh, my things are off, sorry. And then continued. So this puts, this just prints things out with spaces or whatever that N is in between them. Again, for every open parenthesis, you have to have a closed parenthesis. Print ends with a new line unless you tell it not. All arguments in all functions are separated by commas, and end equals space tells print to add a new line and not, sorry, to do a space and not a new line. Okay, so what time is it? Okay, I'm going to go back here, 1.3.2, because I want to show you some things that happen when you do something wrong. It's always easy to look at this stuff when you do something right, but when you do something wrong, um, is this the one I want? Do not add spaces after each line. Okay, this is not the one I wanted. Sorry. Uh, this will do. So this is just converting. It's just like what was on the slide. But I want to show you some things that will happen if you don't get things right. So let's say, first of all, that I don't have my parentheses balanced. Well, first of all, I get a lot of little red squigglies in PyCharm. But secondly, when I try and run this, let me edit the configuration real quick. When I try and run this, I get this nasty red error down here. And it's telling me there's a syntax error, and it's showing my int equal my stir, and it's saying there's an invalid syntax on that line. It's saying there's invalid syntax right there. The line looks right to me. Could you please put it on mute, whoever is, doesn't have it on mute? Um, but I didn't change line 7. Line 7 looks completely okay. This is a quirk of all programming languages, partly because computer programmers write programming languages, and computer programmers aren't really good at writing error, descriptive error messages. So what's happening here is that the first time Python recognized there was a problem was at line 7. But the problem is really at line 4 because I decided to take away a parenthesis. I put the parenthesis back. Everything's okay, and I can run this again. Now, if I take away a colon, or sorry, a quote from a string, the same thing happens. Okay, bad things are going to happen. In this case, I get this EOL while scanning string literal. String literal. That's because it's looking for another quote, and it can't marry up the second quote. So. These are just some things you're going to have happen when you're programming. So if you start to get errors like this, don't get frustrated. Look back and also do things like this because you can always comment things out. 
And if you're not sure where something is, just comment out the rest of the lines, execute the first line, and see what happens. Uncomment the second line, execute the first and second line. It is a way of taking baby steps and helping make your program easier. Um, so, the secret life of a program. Again, we're talking about input process output. We're going to have the following, uh, the following program is going to calculate yearly and monthly salary given an hourly wage. The program assumes work hours are 40 hours a week. Um, 40, sorry, 40 hours a week and uh, work weeks per year is 50. So I've got my start. I'm going to have my input. Hourly wage is 20. I'm going to make it an integer. My process is going to be yearly equal hourly times 40 times 50. So it's going to be 20. So that's 40,000. Monthly, I'm going to get my monthly salary, 20 times 40 times 4, 3,200. And then I'm going to output annual salary is yearly. And then monthly salary is the monthly. So that just kind of brings everything into uh, relief about what the program is. Oh, and then I end it. Statements and expressions. There, are, there is a difference. Um, a statement typically gets input or output. An expression alters data. That's generally the rule. So my x equal equal input, my y equals input, my area equals int x times int y is an expression, not a statement. And output is going to be a statement. So our processes are usually expressions and everything else is a statement. It's a distinguish, it's something that Zidebooks distinguishes I thought it was important to kind of enforce that. I've never asked and I've never been asked by anybody in any field where I have been working as a programmer to tell them the difference between a statement and an expression. So that's all I'm going to say about that. This is important. Cases and spaces matter. Python is a case sensitive and space delimited language. And what does that mean? Well, what that means is that these two variables, x, lowercase x, and uppercase x, are not the same thing in Python. They are completely different. Python does not look at, um, let, me, let me back up, in a world where Microsoft Windows is the predominant operating system, people don't care about case sensitivity because they don't have to. Python doesn't Sorry, uh, Windows does not distinguish between a capital A and a lowercase a. This is not the case in the rest of the world, and including Python, Java, C, C++. All of these are case-sensitive languages, which means a lowercase x is not the same as an uppercase x. And that can be extrapolated to all the characters. So it is important to understand this. This is one of the places where I see students make their real, the first frustrating mistake because they think that when they typed a word that that you know and that you know day starts with a lowercase d and they've got day typed somewhere else with an uppercase d, they don't understand why it's not the same. For Python, it is not the same. That's really what you have to know. We can go into ASCII tables. We can do all that. But what you need to know for this class is a lowercase letter is not the same as an uppercase letter. They're two completely separate things. So space delimited language, unlike Java and C++ and JavaScript, um, Python is a space delimited language, which means that 
it has to infer when a line ends, when a statement ends, when an expression ends, for the most part. Now, we'll change that a little bit as we go forward, but for the first two weeks, if you don't have your, um, your expressions or your statements on separate lines, Python's not going to work. It's just going to give you an error. So let's go back to cases and spaces real quick. Where it, oh, spaces and spaces? I think I misnamed that. Okay. So this is just something I made up to make it easy to, to see this. And it should have been cases and spaces, but I, rena I named it wrong. Uh, spaces and spaces. Okay. So I'm just going to debug it because I like the debugger. Oops. There we go. So Python got very upset. That's Python being very upset down there. And what happened is, I think I, sh I, think I hit run and not debug. No, I hit debug. Okay. Python got very mad because this is just incorrect. Okay? Because it cannot figure out what to do. It says end of statement expected. That's PyCharm. So the program won't run, okay? Invalid syntax. This is one of the ways, this is one time when you will actually, t it will tell you where things have gone wrong. And in this case, it's because Python doesn't know where to end things. So if you do this, all of a sudden, everything runs fine. If you do this, things don't. Invalid syntax. So, Cases and spaces matter. Now let's, let me go do this again because I just want to show you in the debugger when we look at variables down here, it will create two separate entries. One for lowercase x, one for uppercase x. Okay, lowercase x is two. Um, this is correct and this would have been incorrect but I changed it. So that's what I mean by space delimited language. If you start to see weird errors, like the first one you saw, you need to take a look and see whether or not things are ending properly. Um, so not all characters are visible. We will get into this a little bit more next week. But there are what we call non-visible characters. There are space, there are tab, there are new line, you, you, you can do a bell. There's all kinds of things. But there has to be a way to represent those things in a string in Python. And basically all I want you to know is that every single character, whether it is visible or not visible, has a numeric representation. And that's important because that numeric representation tells us what we can and can't do. So when Python looks at a character, underlying Python actually, it's going to convert it to that number. Um, and when you handle special characters like a tab, like a new line, you need to use the backslash. The backslash is your friend, and I'm telling you this because you're going to have to do this, I think, this week in one of the labs. Um, so if you have a new line, it's going to be backslash n. If you have a tab, it's going to be backslash t. You, if you want to put a backslash inside a string, you have to do a double backslash. You can get really headachy here. Single quote, you might have to backslash. Double quote, you might have to backslash, depending on where it is in the string. Arithmetic operators, plus minus, multiplication, division, exponent. Those are the arithmetic operators for Python. They're pretty much like they were in all mathematics. Okay. So now we're going to go into the labs. Um, and basically what, 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 sorry, in week one and week two, I'm going to go over the labs as flowcharts. 
And I'm also going to talk to you about how to read and take what you're reading from the lab and make it into code. Because this is one of the areas where I also don't think Zybooks teaches you how to understand this. This lab is a set of requirements. When you go out into the programming world, you're going to need to understand what requirements are. Requirements don't come in a list. Sometimes they come in an email and you have to create the list and understand how that's going to work in the object. Got that this week. You know, another programmer was like, Lisa, are you looking at this? And I'm like, no, nobody's told me to look at that. And they're like, Oh, well, that's because the guy was supposed to tell you went out on maternity leave or paternity leave. So here's what he needs. And it was just like two paragraphs. No bulleted list, nothing. And I had to go and turn that into a set of requirements. So what you're going to get in the real world are word problems. So let's talk about how to read a word problem, okay? So it says complete a program to read four values from input. That means you're going to use the input function four times. Because somebody's going to type in, in this case, Zybooks, is going to type things in. And you're going to store the, the values in variables. And it gives you the variable names here. It tells you one's going to be first name, one's going to be generic location, one's going to be whole number, and one's going to be plural noun. And then the program is going to use these to output a short story. So. This is about how to use the input function. So this is, in fact, a flowchart. I'm going to input the first name. I'm going to input the generic location. I'm going to input a whole number. And I'm going to input the plural noun. And I'm going to output the story. And I didn't put that here because PyCharm, sorry, um, Zybooks gives you the output format. So all you have to do is do the input. So this is all about getting input. Now, something to remember with Zybooks. Don't ever put anything in between the parentheses on the input function. Zybooks will, will fail it every time. Zybooks can't handle it when you put something inside those parentheses next to the input function. So just leave it out. Okay, so this is lab 10. There's a variable like usernum can store a value like an integer. Expand the given program as indicated. One, output the user's input, two points. Two, output the input squared and cubed. Computers compute square as usernum times usernum. And get a second input into usernum two and output the sum of the product. So this is all about input and outputs. You're going to end up having two inputs, and you're going to have several outputs. So when it says input, you're using the input function. When it says output, you're using the print function. Those are general rule of thumbs, and they apply throughout the entire class. So we're going to have a start. We're going to input user num. We're going to convert user num to an integer. Now, this can be done on the same line or multiple lines. It doesn't matter. Flowcharts are programming language agnostic. So I'm talking to you about the logic. I'm not talking to you about Python. Not right now. We're going to square user num. We're going to input user num. Oh, sorry. We're going to output the squared value of user num. Those are, we're going to cube user num. We're going to output cubed user num. Then, we're going to input, we're going to have our second input, we're going to convert it, we're going to do the sum, we're going to output it, and we're going to be done. Oh, sorry, and then I have to do the product. I'm going to output it, and then I'm going to be done. So there's a lot of steps here, but these are the logical steps and some you can combine. 1.21. So write a program using integers, user num and x as input and output user num divided by x three times. So we're going to use the print function and we're going to use the input function twice. 
we're going to input a user num, it's expected to be an integer, and an x, which is expected to be an integer. If I am, if I am using the input function and I'm expecting the user to input an integer, I have got to convert that user input into an integer explicitly. So I've got to use the int function. And I will put the input function inside the end function. Or you can do it on a separate line. Um, so I'm going to start input user num, input x. I'm going to convert user num to an integer. I'm going to convert x to an integer. I'm going to divide user num. Div equal user num divided by x, output div. Div2 equals div divided by x. I'll put div2 and then div3. So when you look at this, I'm not using user num. I am dividing the output of user num divided by x. I'm doing that this for the second time and then again for the third time. So you're not just doing user num divided by x three times you want the product of that division to be then divided again. Okay, writer programming using inputs, age, weight, heart rate, time, respectively. So we're going to have four input statements. I'm going to output the average calories burned for a person. Output each floating point value with two digits after the decimal point, which can be achieved as follows. So that's the print statement. You don't have to do anything to that print statement. You just have to make sure that your variable is named calories because that's what that's expecting. That is a variable name and you're going to want to use it. It's going to be lowercase. So we're going to start. We're going to input the age, weight, heart rate, and time. And then we're going to do our calculation. We're going to convert all of these things to integers because they all have to be converted to integers because Python assumes anything coming into the running program is a string. We're going to calculate calories, which is provided in the script by Zybooks. You're going to output the calories. You're going to output that exact thing right there. And you're going to be done. Now, this is a lot of work this week. Um, not all weeks are like this. So the last, this is going to have two parts. The last lab is you're going to prompt the user to input an integer between 3 and 126, a float, a character, and a string. Um, store each of these in separate variables. So that means you're going to have one, two, three, four inputs. Then you're going to put the four, output those four values in a string, uh, in a single line separated by a space. So this is, remember when I said you don't have to um, end everything in a new line with print? You can end it with a space. That's what you want to do here. Expand to also output in the reverse. Expand to convert the integer to a character by using the care function. So that's a brand new function. We didn't talk about it, but it works just like int, and it works just like stir, and it works just like float. So we're just going to get our four variables as input. And then we're going to output it in one order. We're going to output it in the other order. We're going to convert user into a care, sorry, chr function. Output the character, and we're done. And down here, by the way, is an external reference for that. If you want to see how the care function works, that link will help you. OK, so that is my lecture. We can go over some more things if you want to, please. Uh, feel free to ask any questions, open up the mic, uh, let me know how I can help you get through week one more successfully. Hey, uh
Good evening, ma'am. Uh, Joe uh, Romero here. Had a c couple of questions. One was asked in the text box by another student also. Um, in one of your first examples, you set a variable name and then you entered equals zero and then you defined the formula for uh, that variable later on. I believe it was on the total coins. What was the purpose of identifying the variable as equaling zero rather than just doing the calculation later on? Um, it's a habit for me. Most okay. of the stuff, if, if you're dealing with things in different scopes, which we will start to do in week three, you're going to have to develop the, the sorry, you're going to have to define some variables outside of a local scope. So that's what the purpose was. It's just, and it also is to show you that total coins on one line is the same as total coins on the other. You're just swapping out the values. I'm trying to remember which one that was. I believe it was the total coins. I'm looking at my work in Python from this week. Is it this one? There we go, this one. Um, so this is just some of its habits. But also, I want you guys to know that this total coins is the same as this total coins. So when we ran through it in the debugger, you could see, whoops, got the wrong one there, sorry. Um, 3.11.2. So when we ran through this in the debugger and we look at variables, we look at variables. If I step over, I've defined total coins as zero. I'm going to do my nickels. Five nickels. I'm going to do my dimes. I'm going to say ten dimes. Put the enter key. So now I've got total coins here again. When I step over this line, you won't see a new total coins down here. So the total coins on line 10 is the same memory space as the total coins on line 5. Only thing we're going to do is swap out the value 0 for the value of nickel count plus dime count. So total coins has changed to 15. So it's the same variable. It's not a different variable. If those names match exactly, it's the same memory space. Does that make sense? It most certainly does. Cool. And then uh, I'll ask my last question and then give everybody else a chance. Um, in one, or actually it's in this one, you have a print uh, quotations. This is uh, space quote plus string for total coins. Yes. In, uh when I was doing this exercise this week uh, in Zybooks, <clears throat> I put everything in PyCharm first to make sure that it worked for me. Uh, I left out the string and the uh, open and close uh, parentheses, and it seemed to work in PyCharm 3. Point, or sorry, in Python 3.10. Okay. <clears throat> and I was just wondering if, if there was, by syntax, a reason to do one versus the other. Yes. So when I have the plus sign, I will get this. You can only concatenate a stir, not an int to a stir. So a plus sign, if you've got a string with a plus sign, you're telling Python that you are going to concatenate two strings. So you're going to butt them up against each other. Um, I can't do that with a string and an integer. Now, I believe what you're talking about is this. Yes, I was using a comma and not a plus to. Yeah. Okay. And that will work. I, I've been programming Python for too long, and this is the way you used to have to do it. <coughs> this is old habits die hard. So the comma is different. The comma will do the conversion for you. Some of us old folks, 
you know, I'm typing how I normally do it. So um, some of us old folks just have old bad habits. But that's why it worked for you and it didn't work on this one because it was the difference between a plus and a comma. Does that make sense? Makes 100%. I actually learned a few years ago where we were using the plus sign and then I just started using the comma just now. So makes 100% sense. Thank you. No, not a problem. Anybody have any other questions? I'm completely happy to answer anything you've got. Um, I had a question about um, the announcement earlier this week for the week one announcements. Okay. Uh, for specifically the ZY Books um, participation activities uh, on the announcement, it said to hit the subscribe button at the beginning of each section. However, when I tr try to find like a subscribe button, it's not there for me. Subscribe button. I don't know. Um, you shouldn't have to use a subscribe button. The only thing you should have to do in Zybooks is get to it from the link in the module. Uh, yeah, it, it seemed to be working. I was just a little nervous because of the wording inside the announcement. Okay. Um, if so, here's here's how you test that. Go in and do some of your participation activities. See your grade in Brightspace change, then you know that the Zybooks is hooked up to Brightspace. Because that's the only issue. Where um, the activities, the participation activities are auto graded. So Zybook sends any change in grade immediately to Brightspace. So as long as you're, you're seeing a change in that participation activities grade in Brightspace, then you're, you're fine. Because you don't have to worry about it for the labs because we, the teachers, go out and we grade the labs. Okay, that makes a lot of sense. Thank you. No problem. Anybody else? Anything? It's fine. Uh, you guys can answer any questions you might have. Going once? Going twice? Close. Okay. Hi. Hi. Uh, well, I'm just a little confused about the whole situation, so I might need like some tutoring or something because I just need some help. Okay. Um, I don't know. Are you in my class? Uh, yeah, I believe so. Okay. Um, so I, I open the lectures up to all of the students taking IT 140. So, um, and I don't know all my students' names because it's first, it's the first week. So if you're in my if you're in my section of IT 140, reach out to me. Um, if you're not in my section of IT 140, reach out to your professor, but also reach out to your advisor. There are tutors available for individual tutoring. Okay, and no, I'm I'm not in your class, I guess. Okay, I don't feel comfortable tutoring other professors, students, or answering emails from other professors, students, um, but your advisor should be able to get you to some tutoring services. There's also places like Code Academy that I have heard are very, are very good to help students who are struggling in this class. Okay. Thank you. You're welcome. Um, I hello. Hello. Okay. My name is Shakira. Nice to meet you. <laughs> yeah. Hello. So I have a question about 122 Lab. Okay. So I think, I know I came in at the end of the class, but I did see the part where um, you had showed the process of inputting, and I felt like I did it right according to what you put in, but 
it's not it's not going through. It's not you know saying that I got the right answer. I put like I assigned age, weight, heart rate, and time with yeah. flow and input with flow input. Uh huh. And then I put um. I print and then copied and paste the calories and the format. And it said that it would come up with the error message. Okay. You know, so I don't know what I'm doing wrong. <laughs> tell me what the error message is. Okay. Let me run the program real quick. It says a syntax error, unexpected EOF by pressing. So after I print and put the and put the um the formula, I put the print and formula on line eight, and it's saying that there's an error on the next line, which has nothing in it. Exactly. Um, my guess is that you left a parenthesis off on the print statement. Oh really? <laughs> Hold on, I'm gonna try it, and if that's so, I'm gonna be just no, amazed. <laughs> That happens to everybody. Even me still. Okay. okay, now it's they said there's another error with my formula. Okay. Hmm. So well you got past that one. So mm -hmm. uh, does it tell you what the other error is? It's saying trace back file main dot pi in line two which is line two is my formula, and it says age is not defined. Okay, so did you define a variable called age? Yes, I, I, I assigned it flow input. Okay, so if, let's just do this real quick. Um, I'm not going to go over the full lab. I'm just gonna Okay. Um, let's just call it age for better. So, did you do something like age equal int like that? I didn't put int. I put float and then the parentheses and input. Okay. So, is age supposed to be a float? No. Here, so age should be an integer. Wait. Okay. Heart rate. So these are all integers. Oh, okay. And here's something to do. Now, you're going to have to take all this extra stuff out when you're in Zybooks and you've run it. But what you can do is you can do this. Okay. This print statement should eventually go away. It shouldn't be in the final lab. But what you can do is you can check that your input is the way you want. So if I... Go back here, go find age. What I can do is I can check, okay? So I'm going to input age is 42, and I'm going to output 42. So I know that this input statement works correctly. This is programming in baby steps. And a lot of times new students dive in and they try and write an entire program at once. Most successful programmers I do, I know, don't do that, okay? You write a couple lines of code, you test a couple lines of code. You're happy with those lines of code, you write a couple more lines of code, you test those lines of code. So, and, and Zybooks doesn't talk enough about this in my, from my point of view, but what you should do is baby steps. So I'm going to say age, I'm going to say time is int, input, I'm going to say print time, run it, age is 42, time is zero. And then if I want to do a calculation, I can say um, calories equals age times time. And I can print calories. So you'll notice that I have some statements in here that I don't need, which are those print statements. 10 and 10, and I get 100. I don't need these statements. 
and eventually I'm going to get rid of them. But what they make it is, they make it so that you can see whether or not your input is going in as you expect and that your output is coming out as you would expect. And then later on, when you go to really run Zybooks and, and are going to submit it, get rid of that and get rid of that. So you want to do this in baby steps, and that is what will help you be more successful in programming. Write a couple lines, test a couple lines. Even though Zybooks is going to say it's not right, you can at least see the output that you're expecting, whether or not it's coming out or not. Then you can clean it up and make Zybooks happy. Does that help? Yes, it helps a lot. Because I did do that, I just ran through assigning it and I couldn't figure out where I was going wrong so I like how I like how you did it yeah so and just remember Zybooks is going to complain the other thing to remember about Zybooks Zybooks is extraordinarily picky if you have a space out of place if you have a comma out of place if you have a new line out of place Zybooks isn't going to give you credit um, if you are in my class, I cannot answer for any other teacher, if you are in my section of IT 140 and you find that happening, don't spend a lot of time spinning your wheels, take an image, send it to me, send me your, an image of your script, send me an image of the output and what Zybooks is telling you, and I'll let you know if you have to keep working or if it's good enough. And that's just for my students in this section. So, um, can I help you with anything else, Shakira? Um, no, you know I can't answer too fast because I'm probably going to need your help on the next one. <laughs> but I'll send I'll send you a message. Okay, if you're in my section, absolutely send me a message. Yes. Okay. No problem. Thank you. No problem. Anybody have anybody else have any other questions? Going once, going twice. Thank you, everybody, for coming. I hope you have a wonderful weekend. This should be up tomorrow around noon on my YouTube channel. So have a good night, everybody. I'm going to stop the recording.